we have a function that expects an int, and we pass it an int, everything works great. Hey, uh, what if I want my function to work with all the different int types? We could create a different function for every single data type. Go requires every function to have a unique function name, and we'll also have to change the data types for the parameters as well as the return values. I haven't even created the unsigned ints yet, and I've had enough. Well, we could create just one function if we use empty interfaces for our parameters. Yes, we can narrow this down to just one function, as long as we set the data type of our parameters to empty interfaces. Now, we're still going to need to make sure that both of our arguments coming in are of the same data type, which we can use the sprintf function to do that. We will be using a switch statement to check the underlying type. Since we're passing in an interface, we can use type assertion. So x.type will return our type and set it for our case. We'll need to create a case for each one of our data types that we'll be checking for, and we will have to change the data type for every single one of these. And finally, we'll need to create a default statement to handle any cases where we don't recognize the data type. This just creates one giant function of redundant code. There's got to be a better way. I would suggest a reflect package, but I don't think it would be any better. And that's where Golang generics come in. If you like the content, please like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out, and it is greatly appreciated. Right after our function name, we put a set of square brackets. Inside those brackets, we put our type parameter as well as our type parameter list. The type parameter list will determine what data types our type parameter can be. As you can see, we used an uppercase T for our type parameter, and we're using it to set the data type of our parameters as well as our return value. Here, we have three pairs of numbers, each with a different data type. And we're gonna invoke each one of these pairs. Since we have int 8, int 32, and int 64 in our parameter list, we can use it for our type parameter, which we'll use for setting the type of our parameters as well as our returned value. And as you can see, we've handled many different data types with very minimal code. Hold on there a minute. Does not match inferred type? So our type parameter will be set to one of the data types in our type parameter list. And since we're setting our function's parameters x and y with this type parameter, they'll need to be of the same data type. Since we are using variables, the compiler can simply look at the data type of the variables. Since the first argument passed in was a of type int, it inferred the type for the type parameter to be of type int. Let's look at an example where we're passing in literal values. So when we just pass in 8 and negative 3, the compiler is going to infer it to be of type Int. Now let's say we want the compiler to use a particular type, in this case, int8. To do this, we're going to use something called instantiation. So directly after our generic function's name, we're going to put square brackets with the data type we want to use inside. And as you can see in the terminal, our instantiated value is of type int8, and our inferred value is of type int. That beats writing all that extra code, but is there anything you could do from an order function? I mean, the parameter list is getting ridiculously long. Absolutely. We can boil this down to a single type constraint. All type constraints are interfaces, but interfaces are no longer just about what methods they have. These interfaces don't need methods to be useful. They can simply define typesets for type parameters. All right. To save time from creating our own constraints, we're going to use the constraints package, and it has a bunch of constraints built in for us. We have one for complex numbers, for floats, integers, and that can be broken down into signed integers or unsigned integers. But the one we're concerned with right now is the ordered constraint. So taking a look at this, if we look at the code for it, um, it is for any type which could be ordered. So we can use these uh, less than or greater than operators on it. You know, we can use that on integers, floats, and strings. So we could write this in our own code, but like I said, we want to save time by just bringing in this package and then using the, these constraints already built in. So uh, we have our integer uh, constraint, and then we have this vertical bar, which means it's a union. We're going to go ahead and you know, everything to the right of that as well. So we all you know, our float constraint is included in the vertical bar as well as strings. So let's go ahead and take a look at integers, which we have. It breaks down further into the signed and unsigned constraints, which we have all of our 
signed uh, integers. And on the other part, we do have our unsigned integers as well. So if we go back to this, we have our floats. So we have our float 32 and float 64. And we also have strings. Now we have this little tilde here, which means uh, anything that has an underlying type of string is allowed as well. So we could create a data type called my string, and it should still work because the underlying data type is of type string. And if we go back to our integers, we have these little tildes here, so we could create our own int as well, and that would work as well. Now hold on there. I thought the constraints package was going to be part of the Golang core library. Correct. Currently, the constraints package is not part of the Golang core library. Here we have an article that is co-written by Robert Griesemer, one of the creators of Go, and it says, the new language changes required a large amount of new code that has not had significant testing in production settings. He says, although it is, he believes it is well implemented and high quality, he says, however, we can't back up this belief with real world experience. So this is planned to become part of the core library, but they want to test it with some real world uh, testing first. Generics give us one more tool, but let's make sure we're using the right tool for the right job. If you're creating libraries or APIs, very likely you're going to find generics very helpful. Now, on the other hand, if you don't find yourself finding the redundancy of writing the same code with just different data types, well, you just haven't ran into that problem that generics solves for you yet. If you enjoyed the video, please like and share. Thank you.